Jane have been curating digital events here on YouTube and our discussion is the last one in the series. Host for tonight and I'm Stella Carney, Executive Director of LIFT, London International Festival of Theatre, that brings international works by world-class artists with a focus on the Global South. I am also Chair of Leeds-based Eclipse Theatre, nurturing Black British talent from the North and touring work that prioritises the Black British experience on stage and dig digitally. Also, to try and counteract my laziness, I am also the London Mayoral appointee to London Area Council, and in moments away from institutions and organisations, I created the concept for Black Women in Theatre and co-created alongside Anita Brown, Tita Lola Dewawu, Monique Baptiste Brown and Kim Morgan, the Black Women in Theatre events, including the We Are Visible movement and iconic photo shoot, which brought together hundreds of Black women across generations and working across every level of theatre and performance at the Globe in July last year. I've been invited to chair this conversation that's been inspired by Winsome Pinnock's incredible play, Rockets and Blue Lights. The play was about to open when the theatres across the UK were forced to close their doors. Since then, it has been beautifully recorded for radio and is still available on BBC Radio 3. So tune in if you haven't already, it's not to be missed. So we're here today to open up a discussion and a wider conversation about what is happening in our world today. It has been an exceptional few months and theatre and plays like Rocket and Blue Lights help to create the space for important conversations to take place. Today, we're asking the question, how does the way we tell stories and who tells them define us and our lived experience? From the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on Black, Asian and ethnically diverse communities to the Black Lives Matters movement, stories help us to begin to unpack, understand and reshape our world. But it is important to question who are the authors of these stories? What's the point of view? And what point of view are they being told from? And perhaps ask ourselves, is there something that is missing from this narrative? One of the most impactful images from the past few weeks was the toppling of the statue of Edward Corston and the subsequent cry for us all to re-examine the way British history is, or in many cases is not, taught in our schools or represented on our streets and our public spaces. When Winston Pinnock won the Alfred Fagan Award with this play, she said one of the major themes she wanted to explore was the legacy of history and the ongoing impact of this legacy on the descendants of Africans who were enslaved. Another theme of this play is the significance, necessity and power of love in the face of such a history and the challenge of achieving that. I'm also interested in the representation of painful subjects, what we choose to represent and what we delight and what we deny. I'm delighted that we are joined today by five fantastic, stunning, shining guests. Let me introduce them to you. Winsome Pinnock, multi-award winning playwright and writer of Rockets and Blue Lights. Welcome. Wiley Longmore, award winning actor and teacher of acting who has appeared at the Royal Exchange on a number of occasions. Tony Gordon, former trustee at the Royal Exchange Theatre and pioneer of the Nana Bonsu Oral History Project. Yusra Wasama, a multi-award winning actress and theatre maker in Manchester. And finally, Roy Alexander Wise, multi-award winning director and co-artistic director of the Royal Exchange Theatre. I'm gonna invite each panelist to talk about their thoughts and then I'm gonna open the discussion for more questions from viewers through the comments section on YouTube. Or you can also ask your questions through Twitter at Rx Theatre and join the conversation through the hashtag, hashtag Rx Connect. I'll try and get through as many questions as I can. So welcome to you all. And firstly, if I can go to Winsome, I'd like to ask you to tell us a little bit about how you came about to write Rockets and Blue Lights. Mm. That, that's always a tricky question, how you come to write a play, because usually there are lots of different reasons why. Um, I guess I'll start by saying that I've always considered myself as being part of a group of 
artists, um, black artists. And I've always felt as though I'm contributing to a body. I'm an individual writer contributing to a body of work created by many, many black artists. And together our works tell a story that is often missing from um, the theater space. And given that, I think it's always a very sort of important task and one of the things I noticed was that in the last 10 years, there were very few plays about um, black history, like going further back or going beyond the Windrush experience. Um, sorry, I should correct myself. I said that there were very few plays um, about black history. I need to say that there are very few plays produced and there's an, that's a really important distinction. Mm -hmm. There are very few plays that have been produced by black British writers who write about history. And I had a look at it, at the plays that had been produced over the last 10 years. And when, when you talk, you know, when I was thinking about writing a play about the slave trade as such, I mean, my play isn't really about the slave trade, it's about all sorts of things, including that. Um, and when you tell people that's what you're going to do, they say, oh God, not that again. As though there are lots and lots of plays <laughs> written on this subject produced in British theatres. And when I had a look, I found that that really isn't the case and that there have been quite a few plays produced, but they're not by black British writers. So they're not telling that the story from that specific perspective. And so I, started and also because I'm you know descended from enslaved people so of course I want to tell that story the novelist Andrea Levy said that you know every writer at some point who has that background will want to tell this story and that was the case for me um, and I'd been thinking about it for many 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 years and um, ever si probably since I left university because when I left university I started to read things that weren't taught at university at that time so I started to sort of re-educate myself and you know learn about myself and start thinking um well I'd always had these thoughts anyway but started to kind of form um a background that would be the foundation uh, to my writing as I progressed as a playwright. So there are lots, there's lots more I could say, but I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. If I can just, just delve a little bit deeper, you yeah. talked about the idea for um, Rockets and Blue Lights being um, an evolution. So did the idea, the central themes for you change and shift or refocus over that period of time? What I wanted, what I knew I wanted to write about was the legacy of the slave trade. And that's quite a tricky thing to do because it's quite difficult to dramatize that sort of direct link between past and present. So really, I think what I was always thinking about was that we in our bones feel that that legacy exists within us and in the world. And the Colston statue is a sort of symbol of that, yes. that we live with the history, that it's very much a lived part of our, our present day existence, our day-to-day -day existence, if you like. And for me and other people like me, um, experiences of um, everyday racism also reinforce that. So, um, and also, you know, looking at Turner's painting was interesting because he tackled the subject um, in 1840. And that was an interesting approach to it, I think, that he has. And I've said in other interviews, and I really do believe this, that it is one of the most interesting responses um, by a white artist to this subject. It sort of tackles it head on in, in some ways. Um, but it's full, it's full of really complex and contradictory ideas. So that was another thing that inspired me. Brilliant, thank you. 
Um, Tony, if I can move on to you. And Winsome has given us some really great context there, um, especially about the connection between past and present. So mm -hmm. where have your thoughts been over the last few days in relation to some of the themes and what's happening around in the world for us today, right now? I think there's three words for me. Um, one is value and the importance of that value, the contribution and the relevancy of that contribution and that word history. It could be somebody, it's his story, but is it our story? Mm -hmm. And going back to Winsome's point around people producing from black and every minority communities, our story and the value of that story and the contribution mm -hmm. may be totally different to somebody else's viewpoint. So the current time that we're in, we have a very interesting opportunity to look at the lived experience during this COVID moment and the many stories that will come out of that going forward. But also the roles that we, not just the five people on the panel, but the many people like us in terms of how we will contribute to that story going forward. And for me as a trustee, being on a board for 13 years for the Royal Exchange Theatre, it was a totally different beast at the time yeah. to what it is now. And maybe in, in certain people's viewpoint, this day and moment would never occur because it was totally Shakespearean and it had its own view and it was the royal and all that goes with that. And with the roles of various chief executives, colleagues like Wiley and others, we've been able to be a conscience and utilize our, ex our skills, experience, contacts to enable and that's the, the essence of me being an enabler to enable people like Winsome and others to be, be pure. Because sometimes you can be in the theater and not be pure because you have to play the game. So say for me- Say more about what you mean by that. Purity, say, say a bit more about what you mean about the purity and the context in which that purity has to kind of live. Just break that down for me a little bit. Okay. Um, you can have a play and then you can have a play. So the story you tell can be sanitized or it can be real. So working with the individuals I've worked with throughout the theater, bringing in new plays, new stories, they have to be sold in a certain way. They have to be engaging to enable to have bums on seats to pay the bills. But for that to happen, people have to also understand the dynamic has to change. So it's not the change of any one of the five of us, but it's also about the community and the opportunities for them to be able to come through those doors and feel comfortable about being comfortable. Am I making sense? Absolutely. So the right stories get told in the right and, and And as well as that, it's an engaging environment where everybody feels that they have a value and thought, oh, I didn't know that, but I know it now through this story. I know it now because of that story. Mm -hmm. And then they can engage during the bar, the tea, the break. You know what? I didn't really know this. Now I do. I can fly out of here. They're floating out, smiling, because, you know, it's a safe environment for all to have those conversations. And I'll stop there. Fantastic. We might return back to some of the points you've raised there in the questions and answers from some of the viewers. And um, no if I can come to you slightly, because you were just about to begin rehearsals for quite a radical reimagining of Antigone at the Lyric, directed by the wonderful Roy there next to you in my grid. Um, when lockdown hit, can you share your thoughts about the ways stories are told or don't get told? Sure, I suppose I want to start off in a similar way to Winsome. Um, it's I'd like to honor the people that this, we're not reinventing the wheel. We're not, we're not, um, these aren't new conversations. We all know, of course, in the panel here, people probably listening and watching that these are conversations that have been happening for a long time. And there's experienced people in these conversations in different industries. In our industry, I think, you know, we've got people like Stuart Hall, who's British and uh, gives us these, uh, puts these narratives and these conversations, the, the topics that we're talking about in context and a man like Wiley Longmore is here, 
you know, there's people that have been doing the work. So um, I just like to put that out there that we're not inventing anything new and that there's people that still do the work and have done the work. And it's about building on that, whatever the work we, you know, what we decide the work is. And I think the work is about equality because in terms of your question of like who tells stories and, and, and how it's told, it's so, so, so important to have like a, a, an Antigone, a black Antigone uh, from, uh, I'm from the Somali heritage. Uh, I'm not, um, I haven't got the lived experience of African Caribbean people in this country. And it's a very different experience. It's a very similar experience, but it has its own differences. And um, uh, I consciously choose not to hijack narratives that, I, that, that aren't my wounds, but at the same time, there's reflective wounds in terms of being a member of the African diaspora. I'm from Manchester and looking like this, right? So we know that there's similar things. And I think in terms of the stories that have been told, that we have to kind of what Tony was saying, they come through a whole process. You've gone, the makers and the tellers of a story has, have gone through a whole process. And even Antigone, the fact that an Antigone that looks like me shouldn't be revolutionary. It shouldn't be something new. That's just basic common sense. If anything, the narratives of Antigone, of Medea, of the classics actually lend themselves to the experience of people from backgrounds like ourselves because of the constant contrast and uh, frictions that we have to navigate and the conversations we need to hold in our head just to have our survivability as creative people in our industry, right? Um, so we have to remember before it even meets the audience, there's that whole process and that's where a lot of the problem is. Right, it's that process. It's never the artist of the flesh. It's it's meeting the people and having that connectivity. It's the conversations and the making to, you know, when it gets to that point. And that's where a lot of the problems that I found are. And the problems that I found is a lack of just uh, denial and a lack of acceptance of uh, uh, lived conversation. And I like to think I don't play a game, but also I'm a very easy person to get along with. You know, I kind of see nonsense and have the agility to maybe circumnavigate it for whatever privilege that I have or whatever it is. But there, there is a way to speak in our theatre, there's a way to express yourself and that's not for everyone and everyone is different. And I think it's really important that we hold on to that in theatre and the stories that we tell because I think it's the last bastion of like, where we're not commodified as human beings, right? You've got someone, it's the flesh and the body, it's like the raw thing and and, and we can connect with that and it's an alchemy and it's all these beautiful things that we know as theatre makers and, and everyone can have that entitlement to it and that experience and that connectivity, no matter what the narrative is, you know? And then we go a bit deeper and then um, I think for me in terms of how I, these, this question you're posing me is something that I always have to think about when I enter a space. It's the lenses that are placed on me as an individual, placed on other people in the space. How, and whose lens is it? You know, it connects into Winston's piece, Winston's piece about um, the portrait that Turner's made. Like, what do you see in that image? Uh, what, whose perspective is highlighted? Who's in focus? Who's not? Who's foregrounded? Who's not? These common basic things that somehow our industry and many industries struggle to uh, have the humility to listen and and the deny deny that there's anything going on because we all we all want to make art and it's all wonderful. But when there's um, when someone says, hey, there's a problem, or even if someone might not recognize a problem, that's the thing, it's like, I'm here to make art, I just wanna be the artist. I didn't come here to be a diplomat nor a politician, but you find yourself in those roles um, and find yourself picking up those skills. So that's an interesting thing with the workload of the artists. But the lens, about the lens, there was a project that I did, and it's just classic, and I'm sure people have experienced this or seen this. I did the piece and it was about FGM, and there was a constant gambit, creative gambit offered in the room of, we should start the show with um, uh, someone having FGM done on them, right? If you know about FGM, look at it, it's horrific, right? Mm -hmm. What, we're gonna open the show and uh, do that? Why? Who for? We've, uh, hang on, there's, we've, got, we've got the arrogance to think we're liberating marginalized women's voices in this piece of theater we're doing as if they've not liberated themselves, problem number one. Number two, you're gonna confound uh, a horrific experience that someone might have had for whose voyeuristic pleasure? For who, what for, and why? And the fact that I had to, that I had to even, that that question was even offered in the room, I'm like, okay, cool. There is a space of elegant conversation. Let's talk about this. But the fact that, uh, you know, this is a very individual experience, but I think it kind of resonates in other ways, right? This is just to give it context. It's like, why, why am I even having to like explain that? And it just shows the level of um, the black body and the black voice. And, you know, black, 
and all comes of people of African heritage and diaspora, how it's not, we're not afforded the same, for me, it's just reality. We're not afforded the same things, the same virtues, you know, the same kind of higher virtues of human endeavor. So it's okay to have that. It's, and it's that feminist conversation, black feminist conversation. You don't have to see a rape to have empathy and understanding of what rape is. So why do we have to constantly see ourselves in, in this way? Or, or be placed in this way. And I think that kind of surmises for me the, the conflicts and the conversations before we even get to stage and we get to play, you know? Because that's the thing we want to play. It's, it's, we're human beings, we want, it's about having that space and freedom. But the amount of nonsense you have to knock out the way before you get there, and we're meant to, and I'm, I'm still got to be sane. So I've got to remember to make sure my mascara is okay. Do you know what I mean? Like, I just went to that point, <laughs> you know, I worry about my kids and just worry about the art itself. Mm. So for me, it's just very important of like, I would just want to get to the point of art itself. I think it's it's a birthright. I think artistry and communication and this thing that we do, we're privileged to know it and it's about sharing it and, and how do we how do we have that for people? So yeah, it's about lenses and, and connecting to just my final thought on this before I ramble on too much is Winsome's piece is amazing at the beginning, it's bear witness. Mm. And that's it, you know what I mean? In terms of the concept, for me, it's bear witness and what we're bearing witness to and, and who's allowing us to bear witness and who we're allowing to, to be witness. Um, and yeah, just afford people the benefit of the doubt and grace and dignity that they're coming from a good place, no matter who they are, even if I don't speak like you, mm. do you know what I mean? The most roughneck people, I've got the politest accents. This is what I found in that industry, do you know what I mean? The crew from South Manchester, if we turn up in theatre, we're so well behaved. You know what I mean? So I say everyone from South Manchester, mess it up a bit more because uh, there you go. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, it's a good place to stop. But we're going to open that again because there's lots of things that resonate in what you're saying when you're talking about um, points of view and you're talking about the types of stories that are told, the types of stories that are returned to. I wanted to ask you, Wiley, how does some of um, what users have talked about resonate for you as an educator and an actor? Uh, quite a lot. I like the idea that of this, um, you know, bearing witness, you know, as the user has just talked about, and with some bearing witness, I think it's so important that we bear witness um, and that we can always stand up and bear witness when the time comes and even when the time isn't right, that you still want to bear witness. I was one of the unhappy people who had tickets for the press night of the play. Um, the day it was cancelled, the production was cancelled and the theatre shut its doors. Um, and when I came to listen to it on the radio not long ago, and I listened to it twice because I think it's a complex piece of, piece of work. You need to listen to it more than that to me anyway. Um, and it was happening right at the moment that the world was suddenly again aware of the Black Lives Matter movement. And it seemed to me that it was a moment of absolute aptness that we should be watching this play or hearing this play, you know, and that this playwright certainly has her finger on the, on the pulse still. And that is what I think she was doing bearing witness. When I was an actor, I always tried never to take work that in any way demeaned me or my race. I was willing to play any story that I believed in, as long as I believed that the audience saw there was some kind of integrity in this work, some kind of belief on my part. And I was game for any kind of story to be told through me. When I was a teacher, I could get on the battlements and rouse those students to action. You know, I could say to them, don't take the theatre as you find it now, break the doors down, break the barriers down, and don't just wait for somebody to give you a job, you have your own story to tell, tell them. You know, for out of drama school training, a student will, will work with such skill about what they want to say in the world, and then they get into the world and they wait to be given the job, you know, and I would be on that up there saying, no, 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 get out and speak your own words. Anytime I found myself around a board table and I was the only black person present, I wanted to ask why. When I went, when I trained at the Rose Bruford College, I was the only black student in my year. I'm very sensitive to being the only black person in the room. And around the board table, I'm even more sensitive to the fact that I'm the only black person around that table. And now I'm old. And now I'm thinking, 
where have I come all this while? Where have I come and where am I going? During this period of isolation and, and introspection, I've been writing a lot about my childhood, my growing up in Jamaica. I've been writing a lot about my arrival here in 1971. I've been reading a lot of statements by the people who arrived here on the Empire Windrush. I had to go and look back again at what was then called the race riots in Notting Hill in 1958, the repercussions of which were still very much present when I came here as a 20 year old boy. And in that kind of time of, of introspection and looking back again, I find myself or found myself in the midst of Black Lives Matter. And in a year, I will be here in this country for 60 years. And it feels as if that journey towards this moment is a moment of crisis for me because I still want to ask myself, when do you stop? Do you know, when do you stop trying to bear witness? Do you know, I'm contemplating my retirement. I've been re retiring for several years now and I haven't succeeded, but I'm con <laughs> contemplating my retirement and I'm thinking, I still am been waging war against the dreaded BAME acronym. I cannot tell you for how long. And I'm beginning to think I'm a lone voice in the wilderness because especially with the connection of COVID-19, you know, it's everywhere now, this dreaded thing. You can't open a page in the, in the Guardian without seeing it blazing across the thing. And I still think I want to go on making a shout about it because it seems, sounds like a, a disease to me, that word, that thing. I've been also trying to teach my grandchildren Jamaican songs to try and get them to sing in the Jamaican patois. I've been showing them photographs of my, where I was born in a little house in, in St. Anne's in Jamaica and been trying to tell them what that was like to live in the way I lived and also to tell them what it might have been like for a boy like me coming to this country on my own. And I'm wondering whether that is, you know, is, the, is it me trying to say, you, you, you young children, um, when somebody forces you to listen to another story, remember that you have your own and that you must insist that you want to tell it. Mm. I suppose the feeling I get now as I contemplate this, these things in this moment, this total isolation, it feels like to me, I feel as if I'm living in Fort Knox at the moment. And it's that I suppose you go on plowing the little patch of ground that you occupy. And I suppose you go on making a row. You go on making a noise, even though you think nobody's listening to you. It probably means you need to shout louder. And I suppose what is sustaining me at the moment, not just the fact that I have grandchildren who I think I need to tend, but also that I need to satisfy my own self, that as long as I can, I continue to bear witness. Absolutely fascinating and a really lovely place to pivot um, the conversation before we um, get to you, Roy. Um, Roy, I wonder if uh, you can expand on where your thoughts are at the moment and um, how that's kind of framing uh, the kind of work that you're looking at and the kind of stories that you're interested in. Yeah, um, I mean, my mind is already a bit blown by so much of what all four of you have said already. Um, Wiley, I went to Rose Bruford. I was the only black person in my class. I, I thought that I was one of the only black directors in the country when I directed at the National. I knew that I wasn't, but it felt as if that was the story that was being told in the world. Um, and like you said, Winsome, and I was reading something about when you first wrote Leave Taken at the National and the idea that you were the first black British writer, Natasha Gordon being the first black British playwright to have a play in the West End. All of that, like it, it, it that in itself as a thing tells the story that, that like black excellence is so rare that we got to wait like a decade before we get that again. Um, and, and, you know, it makes me feel that actually like everyone is being robbed. Everybody is being robbed because it's telling the wrong story about who we are and what we do. But I guess it, it fundamentally is, is most dangerous for, for us as black artists because it feels as if we are shouldering so much. And actually, if you realized, 
if we were able to like look down and see all of the shoulders that we stand on, mm. I think we would feel just the same amount of strength and entitlement that so many other people do. Um, and so, you know, it, I don't know, I feel really um, emboldened when I hear you, Wiley and Winsome, talking about, about, you know, your histories, your pasts, the people that you've learned from, um, et cetera. And, and the idea of like passing that story on to the next generation, Wiley, when you're talking about your, your grandchildren. Um, I, I mean, I didn't want to be an artistic director um, if I'm really honest, I, um, I, I, I love directing. I love the rehearsal room more than anything in the world. And, you know, in this job, there's like a whole skill set that is like, that I'm learning so much of and so much about, and actually learn about myself, realizing that I am probably maybe a bit more qualified than I had given myself credit, actually. Um, but, but the reason that I, and that Bryony and I came into this position and, and came for the job is that we, I think we were both at a place in our careers where we were understanding that unless we were, unless we put ourselves in the position of decision makers, then we will always be taking a begging bowl and we will always, our stories, the ways in which we can affect other people's lives, the ways in which we can broaden the thinking of individuals and of many people, the ways in which we can, you know, allow people to see themselves and show themselves to other people. We will, it will never change if the people making those decisions don't change. So it was because of the really horrendous conversations I was having the year before, after directing a play, an extraordinary play that cracked my mind open and made me realize that I didn't have to just be, um, I didn't have to just be the artist that tells a story of my oppression. You know, the play that Natasha wrote, I, I didn't, I really didn't realize, and it blows my mind every time, the revolution was so quiet and so small in that free black women as protagonists. I grew up in a house that is dominated by black, beautiful, brilliant, noisy women. And to be able to read a text that gave me that was just like, oh, and I'm not saying that those texts didn't exist before, they do, but I just didn't see them because the people that were teaching me were white. Mm -hmm. um, and, and having this moment where my mind was so cracked open, it made me go, I can't tell another story about a slave again. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that was just a really immediate reaction in that moment to going like, to going like, I see what this is. I see that every time I tell a story, it is traumatic for me. I am opening wounds. The audiences aren't changing and it therefore ends up being for the, this, this weird kind of like, um, permitted catharsis of, of, of white guilt. And I was like, I cannot contribute to that anymore. So, so I kind of started making decisions like that actually the lens that I place on the work that I'm making as a director has to be me making work for my grandma. It has to be me going, Graham, come watch this thing with me. If there's anything you don't get, we can talk about it after. You know, it's like actually, yeah, so what, what, like making sure that it's as wide open as accessible um, for, for anyone. Um, yeah, yeah. But I found that I was like finding, I was walking into meetings and I think people were expecting me to say, I want to do this, I don't know, name one of the many, you know, American plays about slavery, I guess, um, that come into fashion around Black History Month, roughly. And, um, and I was going in saying, you know what? I didn't read um, Uncle Vanya when I was at drama school, but I actually read it about two weeks ago. And I've discovered that I kind of really like the play actually. And I think it's really funny and I want to do that. And you can see people kind of going like, oh, uh, oh okay. Um, and, and the same thing with Antigone as well. I, I pitched Antigone to a few 
um, ADs and, and was like met with this wall. And I thought to myself, it's so funny because, you know, up until a certain point in my life, every play that I watched that had black people in it or was about the black experience was directed by white directors. But that trade-off is, is, is not, it's not allowed, no. Um, but I'm also like, I don't want to do the black version of, mm. I just want to tell the story with the people that I think are really brilliant. Um, and it just so happened that the Antigone that I met that was extraordinary was Yusra. And it was like, let's do this, you know, and build the world around that. Um, so, so yeah, effectively I ended up going, I need, I have to, because I can't bear the thought of another person like me feeling like they're being constricted and suffocated and falling into another form of like artistic death because they're not given the space to to fully understand and express who they are. You know, it makes me think about that really brilliant line in Misty um, and the character that um, Shiloh Coke played said something like, I want, I, want, um, I want that promenade scene riding on the bike with my hair flowing in the wind. And I was like, yeah, because actually everybody like, you know, yes, Stella, flick it for them. You know, like, it, it, in, 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 make, in boxing the stories that, that black artists have to tell by, by making them about oppression all the time means that black artists start to understand that in order to get the foot in the door, that's the story that they've got to tell as well. So they, they then don't even know that, they, that their existence, their entire existence is not just framed by that. Like, you know, theater tells me more that I am of a, an oppressed or marginalized group than, than the world sometimes does. You know, obviously right now in this year, it's a very different thing, but like there are times when I, I go and watch a play and it makes me feel so taxed as an individual for being black. And I'm like, this isn't my life. Mm -hmm. It isn't, there's so much joy. There's so much, I, you know, like every other human being, I have an expanse of emotions and and I, I just couldn't bear the thought that, you know, generations after will arrive at the points where, you know, they get this big break and then, and then the, the industry doesn't offer them anything else. And so they, you know, and we've all seen it. We can all list so many brilliant black British playwrights who've done the one play, it's banged. They didn't get those TV commissions that supported them. Um, as, as I saw you say, Winsome, in the, in the article, the brilliant article with um, Jasmine Lee Jones that you um, spoke in. And, and you don't see that support that the industry does. You don't see everyone go, we need to hold on to this talent. You don't see the same thing happen. But I will, you know, like as a black artistic director, if I see it, I'm going to go, yeah. You know? And just making sure that like we're never erased I, I, I have, as crude as it sounds to say, but I have the power to do that now. And I, and I don't say that with any shame because it has not been the case in the past. Absolutely. It's really interesting that um, in the freight train of issues and themes and feelings and associations that we've talked through, um, many of the comments have focused to talk about what is often non-theatrical, which is a lens. And it's really, what I find really useful is we're talking about the centering of stories in so many, so many different ways. We can take Winston kind of looking at, you know, the long, the long view, the long view through the lens that actually also focuses in into a small part of the context to tell a story that needs to be told. There's this idea, isn't there, that usually you were talking about the different lenses that are often in the space and how they become um, a different kind of storytelling and a storytelling that, that is for you. And that lens is also about the collective lens, all of those spaces. And then I think, Wiley, you're, you've been talking about the lens that really is looking 
in the long range and the, all of the stories in between and the things that connect stories, be they songs, be they connections, relationships, and all of those things help us to kind of center the story and um, shifting the range to, to encompass what can be celebratory away from the kind of traumatic. Um, and I think it's really interesting that within that context, the kind of eyewitness we've been uh, we've had witnesses to this kind of conversation, which we're going to kind of open up in a second. But the idea that the spaces that we occupy and the stories that we tell are shared experiences we can never, ever get away from. Um, so I'd like to open up the, um, uh, the discussion. Thank you so much for your fascinating and really insightful um, comments and insights. And I would also say provocations because every question raises more questions. Um, so. Uh, I wonder if I can take a question from any of you who have come through the chat. So I'm going to have to do some wizardry into my space. So we'll take a question that says, when theatres reopen with more financial pressures, how can we make sure we give space and voice for adventurous work on our stage? And I think there is this sense, isn't there, that um, risk is going to be thrown out of the window and everything is going to be safety. And of course, given the conversation that we had, um, there is a danger in that. Tony, I wonder if you can talk about your thoughts around that and then I'll ask the other panellists too. Uh, ooh. I think if there was a worse time for this situation to happen, it was then, because I think everybody was riding to the to the right high the flat line of theater now will it impact on jobs will there be a visible life experience now or will everything be online they're the, the questions i'm asking myself in terms of will the bills be able to be paid in order to satisfy a play a an event an extravaganza in, in light of what we used to do and how we may have to change in terms of what we have to do. And, and are we able as black theater, any theater, to be able to modify, recreate, enhance, and deliver a package of understanding in the same way we used to before? And I know I'm not answering the question, but these are the key questions that would be needed to be answered paid for, budgeted for, in light of where we need to be and where we have to be. Absolutely. And that might not mean that the jobs that were there before may not be there going forward. There's definitely change coming. You, I don't know if you can see on your screen all of your panellists kind of furiously nodding there. Does anyone else want to add or respond to the direct question? Um, yeah. Um... It's really interesting because like, I guess from, from the perspective that Bryony and I have had, <laughs> I guess since we began, we had a bit of a rude awakening because there was a very like specific model in which the Royal Exchange was operating. And, and actually, I mean, it was kind of brilliant because it was a bit invisible. You couldn't really always, you couldn't really always see it. And if you found the right play and the right cast, you, like it wouldn't feel as if there was a, a like a, a kind of like, you know, model that was being replicated and so much of that obviously has to be around finance and I love how how oblivious I was and and I guess the ignorance that I was afforded when I was a freelancer to to just go well this play's amazing just put it on and, and I've had this really rude awakening over the last like how many months going like oh, okay you know that there are so many more complications just in terms of that but I think what does happen because we are in this position, we're going like, but how do we change our, how do we change the way in which we produce work to make sure that like that is possible? Mm -hmm. I think if um, you understand that you've got to connect with your audiences, connect with a broader range of audiences and bring them in, in order to tell those stories successfully. Cause I do think it really is about an alchemy of like, who's in the room so that the artists that are telling the stories are not exposed. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, within that, I guess, um, and, it, and it's not easy and we haven't figured out exactly how it is, but, but the endeavor is there at least. And I think when, 
it doesn't concern your own erasure. It's very easy to just go, oh, well, it's not possible. Yes, absolutely. You see what I mean? But actually knowing that that I have to make sure that it's possible that I am seen, I've got to, to navigate that. And I don't think actually that, um, like every play is a risk. From you ain't got no vaccine, from you ain't got no treatment, putting on any play, going to the supermarket is a risk. It is, everything is a risk. So, so I would say as an artist, do not take that, that answer over the next like three years, don't accept that at all. I mean, and then beyond as well, but, but, but like, you know, there is no reason why we shouldn't be experimenting now because Macbeth is a risk just as much as, you know, I don't know, Tunde E. coli's scrape off the black is a risk. It's all a risk right now, you know? So I would encourage people to deserve more and want more too. Yeah. Um, and usually you wanted to come in there as well. Please um respond. Yeah, I'll just unmute. Yeah, so so many thoughts, so many thoughts. I think my first instinct is that um I think artists and black people and people of marginalized groups, the kings are queens of tenacity. Do you know what I mean? So in a way, there's there's always a creative choice and there's always a creative option. So there's there's a, there's a thing that happens, isn't it? It's like I'm meant to be really upset now, aren't I? You know, you know, when you talk about being feeling encased in there, you no, know, there's choices. We've, we've all got choices, and I think David Mamet speaks about how actors were buried at stakes at crossroads. You know, this is a creative endeavor, so it's like when Antigone got cancelled one day rehearsals, gutted. But I'm like, it's all good as long as we're not dead. And I think that's a very real thing because we'll all be in the room together. If we're not in a room and we really want to do it, we'll find a way to reenact it. So we, we're the kings and queens of uh, tenacity and creativity. So it's a case of going, what, what are the creative choices we can make? And I think actually, yeah, it's really shitty what's happening and what's going on. Uh, but we must carry on. We get up each day, we must carry on. And this is the thing. So what are the options? That how, what can we do? And that's also very exciting to think about those things. Do we start occupying outside spaces till, till we feel comfortable being inside? Do you know what I mean? It's, you know, there's history has different etiquette. It's got different um, guises and, uh, and different traditions uh, in this country. So we, you know, I know of all the people that make it up. So there's there are the options. And I also want to say about, uh, when we talk oppression and this and how we can let's be honest when we talk about risk it's just it's about people going it's a risk actually it's because you don't understand or there's a fear attached because you don't this person doesn't speak your language or the the the, the thing that they want to touch upon you somehow feel might threaten uh, uh, uh something that you hold on to in terms of your your position in, in the creative industry no let's challenge that let's open up our fears let's have spaces where we can have conversations because what we can't happen is not take risk and end up with one or two black people doing theatre. The amount of telephone calls I have with gorgeous people that tell me, one girl told me I had to go to A&E when she was directing and writing a show every night so she wouldn't be alone and feel like she wants to die. And we're not talking about spiritual or creative death, we're talking about actual, what is my existence, your existence is in question. So I think this question of risk, let's be honest about it and let's meet it with like, yeah, how, how do, this is an obstacle, how fun, let's just exercise and agile our, our minds and our spirits to overcome that, you know? So I just want to put that out there. It's a very, there's real problems in it. Yeah, if that answers that question. Your end comments have immediately, instantly given <laughs> rise to two shooting hands. Um, I'm going to come to you, Winsome, and then I'm going to come back to you, Roy. Yeah, then just- we'll, we'll have to take some questions. Yeah, just, just to remember that risk, um, implicit in the question is that people will think that putting on plays by Black writers and others who are considered marginalised are a risk. That, that's, that's what the question is asking us about. And um, I'm thinking, yes, theatre is about risk. Of course it is. All plays are about risk. The very form itself is, is you're, you know, you're on a knife edge. It's a live form, you know. Um, and I think what I want to say is that the plays they don't consider a risk are plays that were risky at the point of their submission to the theater. Every single play is, but there is a way that one considers the play perhaps that submitted to you from a black writer, maybe I'm, you know, I, I, I'm not in a, the head of a gatekeeper mm -hmm. and the play submitted by um, somebody else. And when we, we've been talking a lot about institutional racism 
And I think that the word risk has to be deconstructed when we talk about um, institutional racism. There are lots of things we have to consider and that is one of them. Because the people who make theater are in a really privileged position of being able to educate the wider public to lead them to understanding works that they have not been um, necessarily introduced to before. And these don't necessarily have to be works that make them think, oh, now I can access this because it's blah, 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 because there's singing and dancing or, you know, not that there's anything wrong with singing and dancing. I think it's crucial to theatre. It's part of the, uh, the, the, the theatrical spectacle. But, you know, we, we, we are in a position to make the work excellent. Mm -hmm. And we are in a position to make that work mm, risk-free in terms of its commercial potential. I'll just say one more thing before I stop, is that when I started, the Women's Theatre Group would take my work. I'm, I was a very young uh, writer, and they would treat it as though it was, um, <laughs> you know... Um, they would throw a, pro a production at it that made it feel, even though it was in the studio, like some lavish, huge production. They made it, they put everything in that work to make it successful. And I think that's what people need to do. The writing of a play is one thing. When you're talking about risk, don't look at me because I'm going to write the best play I can. Look at yourselves. Look at what you're going to do with that play, how you are going to help me to develop it or other writers to develop their work and what production values. I loved what um, Tony said about value um, and in all its repercussions, all its resonance, that word resonated to me. Value the work. Don't, I, I don't wanna hear about risk because it's not my issue. It's not my problem people will come and see vital, great work. And that is not just on one person. That is a collaborative effort. So I'll leave it well, there, you thank you. In there. Thank you, Winston. I mean, wow, yeah. I, I, I've gone on a bit of a journey from what I was gonna say. I'll try and say them both. But like, yeah, I was gonna say like, um, it's really interesting that, you know, the the very real difficult questions that artists are having to ask themselves about, about their careers. It's really interesting because I, I think about conversations that I have had with other black artists who have said the very same things, no pandemic. So, you know, there's been another pandemic that's been running alongside our existence before and an invisible one as well, funnily. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so I think like, the, yeah, I just feel, I feel like um, we, like we, we have always figured out ways to like move and maneuver, like you said, Yusra. So, and it was just a tag on to that thought that you, you mentioned about it being a crossroad and, you know, creatively engaging with the problem and finding a way through. And then um, I guess just like in relation to what you said, Winston, just now is that um, you know, all of the, the, the production value that's thrown at stuff. I think something that I have discovered sometimes in theatre is, um, is that like, you know, the black plays can be on, but like the black plays feel smaller somehow, or they feel, they don't feel as like spectacular. And, um, and when, just in terms of value, like when I had the, the chance to do Master Harold and the Boys, the play does end like in a really constricted space. And I was like, nah, if you look at Hollywood movies, they like they go to the extent of casting 50 women, the same height, same eye color, same hair, so that their legs are all kicking up at, they said, nah, these men, it, it's, it's imaginary, but these men have to be given the most stunning ending. They have to win at the end of this movie. And so I, had to, I really pushed in order to make that possible. And it's, it, it's, I don't know, it's just something that I think about a lot just in terms of our stories that like, you know, we, we have, 
I don't know, we have the capacity as human beings to imagine avatars as blue, but not black people as kings and queens. Mm -hmm. And that really, um, I don't know, just really, uh, I just think it's really disturbing that we've ended up in that place. And so, I don't know, I think it's the, the clear and obvious answer to how we make sure that that, that voice that for more adventurous stories, more adventurous black stories, is to make sure that in our spaces, the people that have influence can make those decisions. They understand the work and the stories as well because they help you to mm -hmm. unlock it so that it can grow to its fullest extent. Because I guarantee you, and I know this from the conversations that I was having when I was directing Master Harold and the Boys, is that everyone was like, but surely it's more quiet and it's more tragic. And I said, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing tragedy actually, because I don't need tragedy, but a white mm -hmm. audience member needs tragedy for this story to feel complete. Do you see what I mean? And so, yeah, I don't know, that's yeah. what compounding mm -hmm. ideas from everything that has been I know that we could go on and talk and talk and talk some more, but we have a few minutes left. And I just wanted to throw down one last question so that we can think about the context of the future. Um, does anyone have any burning idea, vision, feel, sense about the real potential and positivity that could be available to us in this moment that is also really hard going and where we're also reimagining what theatre could be. What is the future of black theatre? For you personally? We've survived. We have survived so much. I, when I, when I, you know, listened again, I've listened to Rockets and Blue Lights a few times, but listening to it again, it just makes me go like, gosh, we have lived and without any massive spoilers, but you know, it's really inspired by that moment of, of when Lou is in the scene and she's being whipped and, and the way that she responds to that, it, mm. it just makes me go like, that's not, I'm not saying it's not like a coded like, you know, but it just makes me go actually, in that moment, she realized that she had the power to not take that. She had the power to do something else and, and, and like, I don't know, like in seeing that story, it reminds me that we, we have existed through everything. We have done everything in the world too. We've been a part of everything. We're not the first this or the first that. And then that's not to discredit anyone that maybe has been, but like actually we are, we are so many people and so many things in this universe. And, mm. and to that end, like, I feel like everything is possible. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I feel like there's been pandemics in the past and, 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 right. and we have survived them as human beings, all, all kinds of human beings. We've all survived them, you know, mm. um, despite the challenge that, that so many of us have experienced. So I just think that there's, you know, so long as we're breathing, there's so much more that, that, that we can do and be. I wonder if um, in our last minute, um, Winsome, I can return and complete the circle with you again. Um, is there any um, lasting comment that you want to make either about your piece or about the future of, of Black theatre for you and the way okay. that you... Okay, well, I think what I want to say is that I know that there are young writers we haven't read yet, yes. whose stories haven't been told, we're not young, I'm, I'm gonna uh, correct that. There are writers, I don't care what age they are, whose, whose stories we haven't heard yet. Many, many of them, and they are bursting to tell them. And that means, for me, that means that there is a future that is alive and, um, you know, I'm excited to see what will happen in the next 10, 20 years, you know, mm -hmm. as people, you know, I would just say to people, keep doing what you're doing, keep okay. writing, have the courage, because it's very hard. It's it's oh, not for everybody. Good, just right? keep it's it's really hard. You know, some often I wish I hadn't started on it, you know, embarked on it. I think, what the hell did you do this for? There must be other ways. Uh, but you know, um, yeah, I just think that, you know, just keep keep going, keep working. Thank you. 
I'd like to thank all of our panelists here today. Thank you for joining us and really giving us some of your thoughts, both in your head and your heart. And um, thank you to our viewers for joining us too. Remember, you can listen to Rocket and Blue Lights on BBC Radio 3 and also tune into all the other panel discussions and plays on the Royal Exchange's YouTube channel. Thank you all and thank you. Thanks, Stella. Bye.